Are the amazing ruins that you find in Peru evidence of ancient technology, and what are the implications? Let's look at the seven best examples so you can decide for yourself what you think. Example number one, two different cultures mixed together. You really can't examine whether there was technology in Peru without looking around and seeing that there are two cultures seemingly mixed together, one of which seems to be a megalithic culture with big stones and finely cut lines. And then the other one, small stones just put together as reasonably as possible. And when you look around the world, you see that same thing. Yeah, there's always going to be culture on culture, but there's a lot of evidence around the world that there's a megalithic culture somewhere in the past that a lot of people found and built on top of. And the contrast is magnificent and startling. I mean, yeah, you could say, oh, maybe they wanted just a few big ones here and there, but the, it just doesn't seem like that. It just seems like there's two different cultures juxtaposed together. So yes, I am suggesting that the Inca and many other people groups around the world found that megalithic culture and built upon it. But if in the end we find out that all of our cultures have to give respect to a possible First Nation megalithic culture worldwide, it does not take away from the Inca. I was absolutely flabbergasted when I went in 2014 and 15 to hike through the Andes Mountains. The things they accomplished were unbelievable and vast. This is only the front side of the ruins. It goes up over the mountain and down the back here to the Llama Terraces, but only a third of it's even been uncovered. There's more terraces below this one, for example. The fact that they were able to, on such steep, unbelievable terrain, not only conquer the terrain and make it useful to them you know, to grow things on, but their water management was amazing. I mean, like I hiked way up the uh, mountainside as far as they had excavated, and it still went farther. I can't even begin to tell you how far this was. Sorry for the poor footage. This was, you know, my GoPro. It was even top of the line in 2014, and it's still pathetic. <laughs> but it came from way up the mountainside, and it went and went and went, and it would drop down into the ruins, and then it would just branch in all these different directions. And then like every house, it just, I can't even begin to tell you how complicated this was. I was beyond amazed at what the Inca accomplished. But it wasn't just the water management. It truly is amazing what they accomplished perched on the absolute precipice of mountains. It's just as steep as it looks in the pictures, let me tell you that much. And the fact that they were able to perch on the edges of absolute cliff faces where it dropped off a mile straight down. And to be able to, you know, handle stone, I mean, it's not easy to pick up some of these stones and move them to begin with, much less being perched on the edge of precipices. I just, I can't even begin to give kudos to the level of engineering and architecture that the Inca did. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't recognize that it does look like there's two cultures and really one of them seems to be a previous megalithic culture. Example number two for you to consider are cut marks. There were a few places in Peru that I found cut marks, one of which was on a stone in Ollante Tambo. My guide said that he felt that there was some way that they were using high-powered, you know, high-pressured water in order to cut the rocks. He felt that this one was an example of it, and I don't know where they get the idea that they were using high-powered water, but that's what his opinion was. There was a couple other places where there was crisscrossing, and you can see that this is destroyed, you know, part of it, but what was there um, it had be beautiful crisscrossing marks. And this is not something that's been modern, you know, like cut in recent times. He said this is original. So what they were doing and how they were doing it, who knows? But this is, I don't know, maybe 20 feet up. It's, you know, in the back part of the Ollante Tambo ruins. Perhaps even more amazing are these cut marks. They were wider, deeper. And it goes right right over horizontally and then down the front. This is turned sideways because my camera was accidentally in the wrong position when I took it. But you can see that it goes right up the wall too. But again, cataclysmically damaged somehow is what it looks like because it just disappears in both directions. So who knows what's going on there? The question is, does this look like they were chipping this out by hand? Or is this some kind of tool that they have? Another place my guide pointed out cut marks was on the Nalpa Iglesia ruins. You climbed up this mountainside. It was about 45 minutes from Ollante Tambo. And he actually felt that all of the unique contours and the sharp edges, he felt that that was examples of the fact that they were sophisticated. They did have some other way to do this besides just hitting rocks against each other. 
So for both of us, it wasn't just the cut marks, but it was the magnificence of the ruins themselves. One other place people often use as example of cut marks is a cave just above Cusco, below Saxe Woman Ruins, and I'm going to let you experience it raw and unfiltered as I experienced it. So this is a really sharp edge to it. Um, I don't know why, because it, like when you compare it to like the other side, it's not like that over here. From that sharp area, you come over here and this is really, really shiny, but you know, jagged. And then when you come down this, it's like glass. It's like a mirror. It's, it not only feels smooth, it's, it's just stunningly like polished. And again, for every shiny area, the other areas, maybe not so much. Shiny, wicked shiny, not so shiny. I understand when people walk on it, but again, I don't get it. This is what I mean about you're just gonna have to decide for yourself what you think about all this. So yeah, do I have any definitive conclusions? No, but I don't think they do either. Every time you ask people, you get totally different answers. It's just, it's hard to get any really straight feel for what was going on here. But it is interesting, some of these, some areas, not very many, but some look cut. And again, that is so, I mean, just, it's unbelievably smooth, amazingly smooth. That area continues down also. Very odd. Goes down to that shiny area down here. Could you make a case for that being cut with something? Yeah. But I mean, what about everything else? That's what I mean about it being maddeningly elusive to try to figure out what happened here. There's one other smooth cut area near the Saxe Woman ruins. It's a random rock, and this is in favor of the fact that they might have been able to cut, because why would somebody sit here and just polish this, even if they were using you know, leather and sand? There's just no purpose to it. It's not like it's an idol or a special thing that they want to promote. It's just random cuts on here, but it was so shockingly smooth that this is my husband's reaction when he felt it. wife was pointing out that this right here, oh, as smooth as glass, literally. Smooth as glass, right here, like it was polished. What would be the point of doing that unless it was done by a machine? So again, it leaves us with more questions than answers. But if you'll notice where people walk, some of these rocks get really, really smooth. So whether they were doing it by hand or by machine, somebody was doing it deliberately. Example number three, fitting multi-sided stones together. Obviously, one of the most stunning and intriguing things about Peru that causes the most questions is all of these multi-sided stones. How did they do it? Is it possible to just rub stones together and get them to the point where you can't get nine one hundredths of a millimeter between two stones? And although some have separated, you know, the majority of them throughout the country are like this. The common explanation is obviously that they used other stones, rubbing them together, some of which had 70% metal in them, supposedly. And maybe some people were doing this at some point. But again, if there's two cultures, and I would say that the older one is the more precise one, then, you know, perhaps they had a technology that we don't have. After all, there's places that if it weren't for the fact that there's a slightly beveled edge on the majority of the stones, you can't see where the line is. It literally will disappear. But okay, you can easily grant that they were able to rub stones together and get things like that to be that close. But look at this, that slight little lip. You got to remember, rubbing two stones together is not going to easily make that. And it's going to have to go all the way through the depth of the stone also. And if it were that easy, why were all the repair jobs over the last couple of centuries so pathetic? And I mean that in the nicest possible way. Let's look at this one. It's the famous 12-sided one in the back alley of Cusco. And that's me for perspective, five feet eight. And this rock is over five feet wide, four feet tall, and seven feet deep. So you got a picture. If they're off even a couple of millimeters, three feet back, any blemish at all, even the smallest amount, they have to keep lifting this back up, lifting it back up, lifting it back up. Do you know how long it would take 
It'd be one thing if this was a rectangle, but it's got 12, I mean, 12 sides to it, 12 angles. How do you pull off something like that? Even if they didn't have technology, they had to have been softening stones. And I've showed you multiple examples all over the country where, you know, no matter what city you're in, it looks like they had scoop marks. That'd be the most logical thing that would cause you to be able to get these kind of lines. But again, I showed you the Temple of the Moon on Juana Picchu. It towers above Machu Picchu. And that ability to get that right up to the ceiling stone, I would argue that you, you can't do that without softening stone. I mean, no amount of chisel, try it out, chisel, try it out, chisel, try it out, is going to get you those kind of seams, especially when some of these are curved. I don't know unless you were softening the stone how you'd fit it in there. I don't know. It's up to you to decide, but I'm coming to the conclusion they at least soften stone. And if I had no other stones than stones like this, the few that are not in the right places, this would clinch it for me. You cannot possibly tell me that they managed to figure out how to get those to fit together by chipping them. When you look at how many different stones had to fit together to make stones like these work, it just boggles the mind. Look at a couple other places. So, you know, there's remnants of where some of the stones sat. And it'd be okay if it was just, you know, one stone next to one stone, but you've got several stones sometimes in one particular square, you know, two, three foot area, like right there, that would have been four different stones having to fit together, not just on the bottom, but in relation to each other, and then in relation to whatever's on top of them. It just, it's conceptually, you just can't make that work. So when you go back to this, you see what I mean. You'd have too many stones having to fit in too many different ways. And if you're chipping that, you'd be chipping for the next thousand years. Example number four, moving these things. M my guide was so excited. He couldn't budge this one, but he managed to pick up this other one and he was so proud of himself. <laughs> we had a good time going to the quarry, which is about six kilometers from town, three miles, but it depends on how you go too. You could have gone directly across the river from the quarry up on that mountainside. That would have been the most logical thing, straight across that valley and up this ravine, but that's not what they did. And these rocks are huge. We're talking over 50 tons, some of them. These six are the most famous. They sit right on top of the ruins. And when we measured it, you're talking 14 feet tall, seven feet wide, and six feet deep. That's nothing to sneeze at. And of course, the traditional answer, most people say, well, you get enough people on ropes and pulleys and stuff, oh, you're fine. But when you start looking at the angles and the small area up there that they had to what, put 2,000 guys on ropes, it gets a little bit questionable whether that's how they were doing this. And here's the other fun thing. You got to go from where I am in the quarry all the way over there to Ollante Tambo proper, where the ruins are. I was told that the Incas would take the stones and just push them over the edge. At least that's the commonly held uh, perception because this is really steep. And rather than zigzag them down, they would roll them which seemed plausible until we started using modern equipment like a jackhammer to break apart just some concrete steps, make it movable, you know, sizes that we could handle. But imagine this, you've got a 50 ton rock up there, 14 feet high, and all of a sudden you push it off the mountain and it does this, thud. So that means that they got to pick it up again and then start it over again? What if it went thud again? It begs the question, did they have technology to move them? People say, oh, well, I mean, they just rolled them on logs. Well, the eucalyptus supposedly wasn't imported yet. So to get them from one end of town, rather than going straight across the river, the closest spot to go directly over to the ruins, they went all the way down the other end of town along the right-hand side of the river and crossed way at the other end and came back to the ruins. This is where they supposedly crossed. They would divert the water on one side, drag it halfway, divert the water again, drag it the rest of the way. But if you've got a 50 ton block of rock that you gotta drag across a muddy river bottom, and then several hundred yards up the cliff face just to get to the base level of the town, and then up another several hundred yards into the ruins, I think they had more technology going on than we realized. Example number five, random ledges. 
Leisure time is really a modern convenience. If you have to do life from scratch and grow all your own food and make all your own clothing and you can't just run to the store for cheese and hot dogs, this gets a little bit more complicated when you start looking at things like this and thinking, why would you spend your time doing this when you have to get everything done before sunset, which is roughly six o'clock every day? These stairs are not wide enough really for most people to walk on. You can see they're split. This side is, is split from where it was on the other side of the rock. Who would sit there making this? I mean, okay, maybe you could defend this one by maybe they wanted little ledges to put their idols on. And some of these other ones, okay, maybe I can come up with some reasons for some of them. But for the most part, they're really random. It's Most times, they're just unnecessary. It's not like you could put idols on them. They're in small, tight little places where, what, somebody's perched up there, you know, chipping away for hours on end month after month or in little obscure places on the back undersides of rocks, it doesn't make any sense. Personally, I think the implications of the sheer volume of these things caught all over the country is that they did it because they could easily, because they had some kind of technology that allowed them to do so. Example number six, hidden technology. Peru has only slowly given up its mysteries, and some of them we still don't understand. But this one, for example, You'd think, oh, well, just another rock and ledge. No, actually, it is technology. It's a compass. What you're looking at here is not only a sundial, but it's also a compass. The four points point to north, south, east, and west. And sure enough, when we put the compass right up in front of it, forward goes south, back goes north, east, and west. What does it prove? Just that there's more than meets the eye, and it may be a while before we'd fully untangle what really happened, if we're ever able to figure out who did all this and why. Example 7, Cataclysm and Reuse, and its implications. Is it possible that the incredibly intelligent, tall, strong, long-lived pre-flood people post-flood demonstrated some of their amazing ingenuity by building using large, multi-sided stones in order to combat their tremendous geological upheaval that the Earth was still in? In the first few hundred years post-flood, people were living 400 years. As they dumbed down in size and age, it's possible that they had technology and intelligence that they used after they dispersed from the Tower of Babel. Although we'll probably never really know, what we do see around Peru is a lot of evidence of cataclysm. Here's the famous upside-down stone in the Saxe Woman ruins. They know that from the way they fit together and the positions that they're in, that this is totally rotated. Is this evidence of a cataclysm? Why do we see this throughout Peru? Why do we see stones in Ollantaytambo, for example, that are half buried, tossed around seemingly in just random ways? When, when I asked the guides about them, they told me that they're called tired stones because they'd never made it to where they were going. Well, that's certainly one plausible explanation, but to me they looked like they were tossed around in some kind of earthquake which you would expect some pretty violent ones to still be happening in the first few hundred years post-flood. And the more you look closely around Peru, you'll see evidence that perhaps there was a worldwide megalithic culture post-flood that the Inca and other cultures found and built upon. This, for example, is the remnants of an aqueduct that used to come from a lagoon that they feel used to be there about three or four kilometers up the hillside. But again, much of it's gone. At some point in the past, somebody put stones in place in order to make stairs and, you know, areas to walk through. And so you can't even, unless you really investigate, you can't even really see that that waterway used to flow right through there. If many centuries passed between when the megalithic structures were built and the Inca found and then reused them, that would explain why everywhere we look around Peru, we see those two cultures put together. It would be easy to just assume that the Wari and Inca all did these structures, but is that really the best explanation for what we're seeing? especially when we look at the incredibly close, tight, seemingly impossible things that they achieved with just supposedly stones that they're rubbing together. When Nova attempted to reproduce the Egyptian pyramids on a miniature scale, they were supposed to be using only the ancient tools and ways that you know the Egyptians supposedly used. But behind the scenes, Davidovitz revealed that that's not what was happening. He said that the Egyptian workers employed to build the mini pyramid for Nova used modern steel tools that were in no way imitations of the stone tools of the Old Kingdom. But even with these powerful steel carving tools, they were incapable of imitating the perfect joining obtained by their ancestors. 
Their casing blocks did not join properly together and had gaps of 0.5 to 1 centimeter wide, plus broken corners. By comparison, you can't insert a razor between the stones of the Great Pyramid, and that's what we see in Peru. So again, can we just assume out of hand that the Inca did this? Or is it possible that a worldwide megalithic culture post-flood were the ones that were doing these amazing structures around the world? 